On September the 2nd, 2015, a Syrian Kurdish three-year-old called Alan Kurdi drowned along with his brother and mother after their boat sank in the Mediterranean just off Turkey. And they were trying to reach Europe. And the photos taken by a Turkish journalist of little Alan's body lying on the shore and being carried away were shared hundreds of thousands of times online within the 24 hours after his death. And the following day were on the front pages of most newspapers across the continent. This image has been said to embody the so-called refugee crisis. So in this paper, I wanted to explore this image. Um, and I'm not temp attempting a complete or kind of rational assessment of the impact this image had on fundraising or public opinion, as um, Maurice Wren spoke about. Um, rather, I'm more interested in exploring how the discourse around the image uh, and the image itself have become sites of bordering, and how the image, this representation of the violence of the border, is itself an act of violence, an act of bordering, so an act of border violence. So I'm going to begin not with the image, but with the discourse around it. Um, and my first point of three is that the idea of home is emphasised and repeated and I don't need to elaborate too much on how the more explicitly anti-immigration media or politicians employ home to further their agendas. This manifests in some particularly obvious forms. But it also manifests under a veil, a thin veil, of humanitarian intentions, specifically in relationship to the image of Alan Kurdi. Speaking in Parliament in response to the image, Home Secretary Theresa May called for the resettlement of people directly from the region rather than welcoming those already in Europe. And this is what Maurice Wren kind of mentioned as well. And Theresa May claimed that this was to prevent drownings, but essentially it was stay there in your area, don't move too far and wait for us to invite you here on our terms. Wait for us to decide who is allowed to enter. Let us have the final say over whether you can move into this space that we call Europe and that some of us can call home. So that's kind of one side more extreme, like don't move, stay home or go home. But we also see this rhetoric of home in a lot of the more liberal responses or in what I'll call the refugees welcome camp. Not a demand of go home or stay home, but still a rhetoric which sees home and with it immobility as desirable, perhaps. I could talk for far too long about a way a lot of artists have reimagined the image of Alan in a home setting and the way that campaigners have advocated that in a better world he would or should be back home, home in that context meaning where he came from. Um, but for lack of time I just want to focus on, on this one poem. Um, this poem by Warsaw and Shire was recited and shared extensively online in response to the image of Alan, most notably by Benedict Cumberbatch at the end of a play he was in, and the video was shared online. I'm sure you've heard it. Um, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. Um, and I really don't want to qu question like, the fact that she writes very valid and personal and really powerful words, um, nor do I want to question the kind of intentions of those sharing the poem. Clearly, it resonates with so many people, many of whom have experienced that kind of run for the border that the poem describes. And yet, at the same time, I do think it's important to question the message implied by those, like Benedict Cumberbatch, sharing this poem within a refugee's welcome discourse. 
Home is idealised in the poem, not the place, but the importance of home is emphasised, romanticised even. And the only reason that you would leave home, the poem suggests, is if home won't let you stay. Oop. Sorry. <laughs> and while, of course, that's true for many, many people, it also does a few things that we should question. Firstly, it denies the right of movement to the person whose home is not the mouth of a shark or the barrel of a gun. It also denies agency, for lack of a, a better word, to those who certainly would qualify legally as refugee, but still have some degree of choice in their movement. And it solidifies home, almost fetishizes home as a singular place to which one belongs, rather than as something more complicated or perhaps more fluid, as Chandra Mahanti writes. So while this support is coming from well-meaning supporters and it's not the same, it overlaps with the fact that home is also literally enforced upon people by racist migration controls, by the border, by governments who are literally telling people to go home and are literally sending them home. So this discourse which solidifies the fluid concept of home perhaps gives weight to the solidification of borders and the solidification of binaries of in and out, of move and stay, which often has very tangible implications. Which brings me to my second argument, that the image and the discourse around it add weight to the simplistic binaries of who is classified as welcome and who is unwelcome who is in and out, or accepted and rejected. And this binary is central to Fortress Europe's response to the so-called crisis. And this binary is gendered, and this binary is racialized, and this binary is violent. So people who move are either migrant Emphasis on the illegal migrant, perhaps smuggler, perhaps trafficker. They're a mass, an uncontainable dehumanized mass or swarm or flood or herd, depending on the publication. Hyper-masculine, hyper-sexualized criminals crossing borders and ignoring orders represented in images and stories of violent black and brown men who are a threat. An image rooted in centuries of white supremacist supremacist demonization of men of color. And perhaps that's exemplified in the coverage of, or in the responses to the incident known as Cologne, as um, we looked at those images in the previous presentation. Um, kind of echoing this myth of the black rapist that Angela Davis spoke of. Um, and we can see this in Canada's decision to welcome only women, children, and gay men in their Syrian resettlement program, and not single straight men. So these are the unwelcome. All people who move are refugee, feminized as passive victims, often in images of individual lighter-skinned women and children who need saving from brown men by white men, to paraphrase Spivak. And these are the, the welcome few. And Alan Kurdi fits very neatly within the latter, he is a child. He is fair or fairer. He is a non-threat. He's presented overwhelmingly as victim. Victim of traffickers. Victim of his father's choice to board the boat. Victim of warring men over there who have nothing to do with us over here, or so we are told. And he's presented perhaps even as a victim of individual decisions that, or laws that went just a little too far. He's presented as victim of anything but the system, the entire fortress which is actually responsible for his death. In contrast, there are many, many examples of media and politicians painting people who move as 
unwelcome as illegal migrants, threats, danger. And one example I think is particularly interesting is that of Alan's own father, Abdullah Kurdi, um, and the way in which some of the more right-wing press and some specific politicians sought to smear him, first as a smuggler and later as an economic migrant who took the boat simply because he wanted to get his teeth fixed. So within this family, we have this binary separation of victim and criminal, of welcome and unwelcome. And on the one hand, this rhetoric ignores the fact that these categories blur, that they overlap, that they are not solid, stable binaries. And on the other hand, simultaneously, it exemplifies the blurring and overlapping of these categories. They are related, literally father-son related, and these categories cannot be fully separated. And the direct and very intentional result of this kind of binary bordering is increased physical border violence, the militarization of the border. As Defence Secretary Michael Fallon um, says, more send, is deciding to send more warships into the Med to hit the traffickers hard. We also see this kind of binary bordering in the left as well, in the humanitarian world. It's not the same, but it overlaps. As people try to emphasize the difference between refugee and migrant. The UNHCR's Words Matter campaign is kind of a clear example of this. I had a video of lots of celebrities reading out a script that said, a migrant chooses to move country. They are free to return home. A refugee is running for their life. They can't return home. It went on to say, refugees, not migrants, refugees, we are all human beings, but meanings matter. Words matter. Your words matter. Of course, the intentions are very different to the Daily Mail's. And of course, there's a case for pragmatism within the system. And although the video does not label migrants as criminals nor advocate for their deportation, this hashtagged emphasis on the importance of labels in a legal system where these labels literally determine the fate of the people they label implies that migrants have somewhere better to be, home, so they could or perhaps even should be there. Ultimately, drawing more borders. So finally, I want to zoom in on the image itself and ask, can we read this crisis through his body, at least the image of it, or through Alan's skin? We're told that this child embodies the crisis. His body is the crisis, or his body is a site upon which European anxiety about this crisis is enacted. It feels crude to focus upon this, but his being dead is, I guess, what we should start with. He is completely immobile. His body does not move. So he is stabilized. The threat is stabilized. And it's doubly stabilized. Stabilized himself as a body upon the beach and stabilized in the frame of the image in which he lies, reduced to a signifier, the mere symbol of a crisis. And if his body is the site of anxiety enactment, the images of him lying lifeless reassure us that he, the other, is not a threat. To borrow a phrase from Rutvika Andriasevich, who is writing about anti-trafficking campaigns, um, we could say that Alan is otherness in a stable manner. For viewers of the image, 
particularly those who inhabit the comment sections of the right-wing press, there's almost a collective sigh of relief among the tears that he is immobile, that the borders, the bloody border of the Mediterranean and the walls around Fortress Europe <coughs> are doing their job. And his familiarity also makes him a non-threat. His fair skin, of course, plays a role, and this, combined with his quote-unquote familiar clothes and shoes, makes it easier for Europe to gaze upon him. We see this in the hashtag could be my child that was trending in the days after his death. And some other quotes. You see the image and you see your own child. My God, that could be my child who has the same colour hair, the same chubby legs. He looks like he could be any of our children. Of course, if your child's an EU citizen, it couldn't be because the border doesn't exist for them. And Nadine Elnani from Birkbeck's School of Law articulates this really well. She writes, absent from the could be my child hashtag was an understanding of the specificity of colonial histories and present imperial wars and the way in which these structurally, structurally determine positions of power and privilege as between white people and people of colour. Refugees are here, their bodies washing up on European beaches because white Europeans were and continue to be there. Sarah Ahmed and Jackie Stacey wrote um, that skin is a border between self and the other. Alan's skin is undamaged. There is no blood. He does not spill onto the ground. His bodily fluids do not taint our gaze with their otherness. He is whole. There were so many less shared images of drowned migrant children that appeared on social media or in petitions in the weeks leading up to Alan's death, in which their damaged bodies cause us to avert our gaze. In one, blue lung shapes are clear on the chest of a young boy, his discoloured skin is tight over his ribcage, and in another, a girl with bloody eyes, literally the body seeping out from itself. These images do nothing to ease our gaze towards them. Their bodies, even those not visibly wounded, are bare. Clothes are maybe ripped or missing. Too much of their skin border is on show. It seems a violation to look upon them. The skin says too much. But Alan's body is well-dressed. His clothes seemingly, quote-unquote, his best and in an appropriate place, and his shoes still on. His body is contained and closed, and his skin border is intact, which opens him up to our gaze without fear of boundary slippage, without fear of broken borders like broken skin. We can detach him from the violence of the border, perhaps depoliticized would be the word, the images not as violent nor as complex as the border is. It fools us into feeling deeply for this child without feeling anger at the borders around and within Fortress Europe. We don't feel responsible. And as he could be my child, as the hashtag says, it causes us to feel that he is on our side. He is one of us, and as he is hurt, surely we have been hurt, rather than someone who actually, indirectly and directly, we and our governments in our name have done harm to. So this image can be many things at once. This image is a representation of border violence. Yes, this image is also an act of border violence. Yes, as it solidifies binaries of welcome and unwelcome, as it solidifies home 
and is it used to further militarise the borders. But it is also used to hide that border violence. It gives a face to the violence of Fortress Europe's borders that allows us to continue to look and look away, continue to avert responsibility. It gives a face to the violence that the faces turn away. It tells us the border is violent, but we don't really see that. I guess that's